Hey everyone, welcome back. So what's on my mind today? Fear, specifically fear-based manipulation and control. Today, I wanna to dive into how fear and trauma are used to manipulate and control people, binding them to leaders, ideologies, or movements. This tactic has been used throughout history to create mass compliance and loyalty, and no surprise, it's still in play today. I know, you're shocked. I want to explore some real-world historical examples, and I want to dive into the work of key thinkers like Matthias Desmet and Hannah Arendt, and relate this to concepts like coercive control and trauma bonding. So, if you want to understand how fear can be used to control you and society at large, stay tuned. Imagine you're living in a time of crisis, some external threat, a looming disaster, a health scare, or internal social chaos. Hard to imagine, right? You're scared, anxious, and unsure about what's going to happen next. Then, a leader or group or media outlet, aka mouthpiece for some government, steps forward saying, we have the solution. Follow us and we'll protect you and or fix the problem. Now, they don't necessarily say that explicitly, but this is the pattern. This fear solution tactic is the essence of fear-based manipulation. The fear is deliberately induced and then a solution is presented to create emotional dependence. Throughout history, this strategy has been used to consolidate power, control populations, and create loyalty, sometimes blind compulsive loyalty. And remember, this pattern happens at any scale, from individual romantic relationships to families to groups to religions to corporations to political parties to entire countries. Same formula every time. Fear is one of the most primal human emotions. When we're scared, our brains enter survival mode and we become hyper-focused on finding safety. And it's not rational, it's limbic. The person or group offering the safety becomes a source of trust and often dependence. A little side note here. Many people can intellectually understand this pattern and recognize that coercing others with fear is bad. They totally get it until there's a justification big enough that it scares the shit out of them. Then they throw everything out. In this case, they say, it's justified. And they say it's not coercion. It's for everybody's safety, for the greater good. Yeah, where have I heard that before? Psychologist Matthias Desmet explains this dynamic through the theory of mass formation. Desmet says that when people feel anxious, isolated, or disconnected from society, they're especially vulnerable to fear-based manipulation. They seek meaning and unity, and a leader or ideology that offers a way out of their fear becomes incredibly attractive. Actually, not only attractive, it feels like their only salvation. But it's not just Desmet who's explored this. Before him, philosopher Hannah Arendt delved into how fear is used as a tool of control in her seminal work, The Origins of Totalitarianism. Arendt showed that fear is central to creating and maintaining totalitarian regimes. It suppresses dissent, isolates individuals, and makes people more likely to follow oppressive leaders because they're desperate for protection. Arendt argues that fear is used to isolate people from one another, breaking down the social bonds that allow resistance or solidarity. When people are afraid, they become more willing to trade their freedoms for safety, and they lose their ability to think critically. This leads to mass compliance, even in the face of oppressive or illogical policies. I want to say that one more time. Even in the face of oppressive or illogical policies. Those of you who study cults or have been in cults see the obvious parallels. But here again, we sometimes struggle to apply it to current circumstances. We see the coercion in the others, the other side, the other political party. But our party, our group, does not do these things. Our shit does not stink. It's always the stupid evil others. There are even cult experts who know all this intellectually, but cannot apply it to themselves or their own behavior as they you know, spit venom at the others on social media. When they do that, they're using the same tactics of ridicule and shaming they used when they were in their cult. One of the most striking examples of fear-based manipulation in history is the Cultural Revolution in China. During this time, Mao Zedong and the Chinese Communist Party used fear to fuel mass chaos and ideological purges. Mao stoked fear of capitalist counter-revolutionaries, accusing intellectuals, political leaders, and even ordinary citizens of betraying communist ideals. 
there's always the evil others in this equation of coercion. Youth groups known as the Red Guards were mobilized to root out these supposed enemies of the revolution. Now, fear of being labeled a counter-revolutionary paralyzed the population. People turned on each other and mass violence, humiliation, and even executions became widespread. As a Western society, we're almost there. We just haven't gotten to the mass violence and executions yet, but we've mastered humiliation and people turning on each other. Mao's use of fear and chaos kept him in power. By creating a society in which everyone feared being accused, he maintained control. People were too scared to speak out or resist, knowing they could be the next target of the revolutionary purge. Hello, cancel culture. <gasps> what, Mark? You're conflating unrelated things. People need to be held accountable. Yeah. Okay. Who's the judge of who's to be purged and who isn't? The government? The media? The nosy neighbor eager to report you? The loudest pundit on television? Another chilling example of all this comes from Joseph Stalin's Soviet Union in the 1930s. During what became known as the Great Purge, Stalin used fear of counter-revolutionaries again and foreign spies, the others, to justify mass arrests, executions, and forced labor camps. Fear of being labeled as loyal or a spy drove people to denounce their friends, family, and colleagues. If you've been paying attention the last four years, this might sound familiar. Stalin maintained his control through a climate of paranoia, where people supported extreme measures out of fear for their own safety. His regime thrived on fear. Fear of being sent to the gulag or executed kept the Soviet population in line. Even high-ranking officials were not safe from this system of terror, which Stalin used to eliminate political rivals and consolidate his power. I mean, let's go back even further to the Salem witch trials in colonial Massachusetts. In 1692, fear of witchcraft and the devil led to one of the most notorious cases of mass hysteria in American history. People were accused of witchcraft, often with little to no evidence, and fear spread like wildfire through the Puritan community. The fear of witches and the devil was used to justify the persecution and execution of innocent people, as the community believed it was fighting an existential threat. Might I add, an invisible threat. The Salem witch trials show how fear can spiral out of control, leading to mass paranoia and violence. The fear of the supernatural created a situation where people were willing to condemn their neighbors just to protect themselves. And look, a more modern example, the war on terror following the attacks of 9-11. In the wake of these events, governments, especially in the U.S., used fear of terrorism to pass sweeping laws that expanded government surveillance and curbed civil liberties, like the Patriot Act. Fear of future terrorist attacks led people to accept invasive security measures and military interventions they might have questioned under normal circumstances. Politicians and media amplified the fear of an invisible, ever-present enemy, terrorists, leading to a prolonged period of war and mass surveillance. Fear became a powerful tool for shaping public opinion and justifying actions that in a less fearful environment, might have sparked widespread protests against the government's increased power. Before I forget, I want to talk about how we learn about the scary other. Nowadays, you're told who the others are by the news. Let's bring it down to a smaller personal level. Have you ever heard the stories about some woman who meets a guy and he talks about all his crazy exes, and then later she finds out they weren't crazy, he was actually the monster? Abusers talk about the others and paint them with a certain paintbrush. It's a smear campaign. Now, I know some people really feel a deep belief and trust in the news, but the news does the same thing. The news is the one that tells you who the others are and exactly how scary and terrifying they are and how they can destroy everything if they're not stopped. I wrote my uh, university thesis on how film and TV screens affect our consciousness. You've probably heard it mentioned that the brain sometimes can't tell the difference between a real and imagined thing, the same neurons fire. I don't exactly remember everything about my thesis, but I do remember talking about how watching a story on a screen can put you in a hypnotic state. And while you're in that state, you tend to viscerally believe that what you're watching is real. Like, I know many people believe that they're intelligent and responsible consumers of news, but we live in a body that believes the shit we're seeing, even if our intellect may question it. It's basic propaganda. 
That's why things are repeated again and again and again and again. Fear-based manipulation has been used throughout history in various forms, from revolutions and political purges to witch hunts and global security policies. Each time, fear is used as a tool to create compliance and control. As I said earlier, this manipulation isn't limited to just governments. It can happen at any scale. Hannah Arendt points out fear also isolates individuals, breaking down the social bonds that could foster resistance. When people are scared and disconnected, they're more likely to give up their freedom for the promise of safety. By the way, this dynamic is very much related to coercive control. This is where fear is used to maintain power over individuals, making them emotionally and psychologically dependent on the person or group offering the solution. In extreme cases, this can lead to trauma bonding, where people form emotional attachments to the very person or system that's causing the fear. These are entire massive topics of their own, but I want to keep it brief for today. Okay, so to recap, the fear-based manipulation I've described sets the stage for a coercive control by making individuals feel constantly unsafe or threatened. This tactic not only coerces them into compliance, but also builds a psychological dependency on those who offer safety, whether it's a political leader or a religious figure, a corporation selling a product, whatever it is. When fear is combined with promises of protection, it can result in trauma bonding, where victims are emotionally tied to the source of their fear. By perpetuating fear and providing relief, even though the relief is often temporary or illusory, these figures or regimes maintain long-term control over individuals. Over time, this manipulation can become self-sustaining as people come to believe they cannot survive without the protective figure, even if that figure is also the source of their trauma. So, how do we protect ourselves from falling into these traps? The first step is to recognize when fear is being used as a tool. Ask yourself, is this threat real or is it being exaggerated to manipulate me? Who stands to benefit from my fear? This can be challenging because if you're caught in the cycle, you may also feel a kind of safety despite being scared out of your mind. You have to really dig deep. Is their use of fear tactics really necessary? And then second, as Matthias Desmond suggests, it's important to reconnect with others and find meaning outside of fear-driven narratives. When we're not isolated or anxious, we're less likely to fall into the cycle of mass formation or trauma bonding. That political leader you adore, have you idealized them in a way that is almost religious? Is your admiration tinged with fear, fervor, and desperation? Do you really love them? Or are you afraid not to show your love for them? Will you be cast out for not publicly showing your support? Have you projected the perfect mommy or daddy on them? All good questions to ask. So that's what's been on my mind. Do me a favor, please share this episode with others and don't forget to like and subscribe and stay curious.